The CEO of Netflix says the streaming giant is, quote, super committed to reaching an agreement that would end the writers and actors strike currently underway in Hollywood. Ted Sarando said there still remains a lot of work to do to reach a deal. He added that Netflix's wide range of content will help the platform weather the strike, but said the real point is to get the strike to a conclusion so that everyone can move forward. Joining us now, former Treasury official and Morning Joe economic analyst Steve Ratner. And Steve, you're taking a look at this and its impact. That's right, Mika. It's an interesting strike uh, for a variety of reasons. We're having a lot of strikes this summer, but this one has some unusual issues associated with it. So I started actually today with some words, which is to try to outline what's going on here. So there are a few issues. Uh, pay, obviously, they want more. Artificial intelligence, which you referred to before, they, w they don't want artificial intelligence to replace either the writers or the actors. I don't know how to chart that, so we'll leave that one there. But let's talk about residuals, which is an interesting uh, phenomenon. So in the motion picture and television industry, writers and directors get residuals, which are additional payments whenever their shows are re-aired uh, as a rerun uh, somewhere or other out there in electronic television world. The issue is that the changing media landscape has affected them because residuals get paid differently if it's on broadcast, they get paid each time it's shown, versus streaming, where they're paid by the number of subscribers. Now let's just do one quick fun fact. Does anybody know how these actors and directors got residuals in the first place? In 1960, there was a similar strike, about five weeks, by both groups over, uh, over this issue of residuals. And that strike was led by the head of the actors' union, who was Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And Ronald Reagan, of course, went on 21 years later to break the air traffic controller strike as one of his first acts as president. So that's a little fun fact for you to take away with. But let's talk about what's going on in the industry, which is what is driving a lot of this. So you've had, back in, 19, in 2015, 80% of American households subscribe to cable or to direct satellite broadcasting. That number is now down to 49%. Conversely, back then, 52, roughly half of the country had a streaming service, although they didn't use it much, as I'll show you in a second. Now, 80% roughly have it. And so the higher payments from this service went down, the lower payments from this service went up. And that's part of why those writers and directors are on strike today. So, Steve, you're talking about how uh, the landscape has changed. And one of those ways, and this is your second chart here, is how traditional television has really struggled. Uh, give us a lay of the land there. So, not surprisingly, as households gave up cable and moved towards streaming, it had an impact on what they were watching. And so you can see back in 2013, 30 percent of the watching was on traditional broadcast networks, NBC, ABC, CBS, and so on. 60 percent was one is on other cable services, everything from ESPN to Bravo or whatever. But even though a bunch of folks had streaming services uh, back then, they hardly watched them. There are only a couple of them. Now you look at today, 37 percent of television watching is streaming services, and that is almost double the percentage that watch traditional over-the-air services, and it's actually even more than the number of people who watch cable services. So those, again, provide lower payments to these actors and directors than those, but a huge change in what, what people are doing. Now, there's another set of competitors that traditional television face uh, as well that affects their bottom line, which are a couple of other services. So TikTok, which barely existed a couple of years ago, now generates $10 billion a year of advertising revenue, which happens to be almost identical to the amount generated by these four top media companies from Comcast, Warner Brothers, Paramount, and Disney. And so that's money out of the pockets of these guys, again, affecting their bottom line. So, Steve, uh, you know, obviously, eyeballs usually equal dollars. And if fewer people are watching, there's fewer, less money around. And your third chart gets into that about how media spending has been shrinking, too. Yeah, so that, uh, this comes up back to what's happening to these companies as a result of all this. So cable television, direct tel uh, broadcast television, you can see half of the revenues essentially have disappeared uh, on an inflation-adjusted basis over a 10-year period. Home video, which is the old business of DVDs and things like that, almost gone. Movie theaters, partly due to COVID, but partly due to changing habits. Spending on adjusted for inflation is back to the levels of 1982. 
but only, and streaming is up by this amount, $27 billion, but streaming is losing a lot of money for these companies. So net net, when you cut through it, adjust again on an inflation adjusted basis, their revenues uh, have got, the revenues of this industry have gone down by 36%, $60 billion of lost revenue. And all of that translates into stock prices that are nothing great. So the S&P 500 since 2015 is a bit more than doubled, up 127%. And these traditional media companies are essentially right back where they started from. So clearly the writers and directors have a lot of legitimate questions about their residuals and how they get paid in general. But the media companies have their own set of issues, which is part of why the strike is proving so intractable. So again, I'm trying to figure out, Steve, as, as, far, as, as far as these numbers go, you're, you're saying streaming is just terrible for the media companies as far as their, their, long, -term, uh, their, their long term revenue uh, streams and their, their long term viability? Well, so far, streaming has been a huge money loser, some, a fair amount of revenue, as mm -hmm. I showed you, but a lot of profit losses because there are so many of them and they're so competitive and they've spent so much money on product. Over time, that should rationalize as some of them drop right. out, merge and consolidate. But it's not going to be like the good old days where you had a few television networks that effectively functioned as an oligopoly and were able to uh, were able to make profits because they didn't compete that heavily. <clears throat> These streaming services look like they're going to be losing money for a good while to come. Well, and so what that means, Steve, is, I mean, again, I, I'm just, it seems that the only solution for these these companies these media companies so we're going to see mass consolidation like we saw in the airline industry if mm -hmm. there are too many of them out there they're cutting up the pie too much <clears throat> they're losing too much money it seems like we're going to have you know we have three four massive airline companies is that where we're going as far as media goes as far as these streaming services go yeah, we will, I think, definitely see consolidation among the streaming services. Uh, there are too many that don't have a critical mass of viewers. And as we just were discussing, uh, none of them are making any money. You are already seeing the media, the big, their big parent companies talk about being more disciplined about how much they pay for content, how many shows they put on. Eventually, the competitive marketplace will rationalize it. But it is a brutal, tough competitive marketplace for these companies at the moment.